Thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from the Congregational Church of Needham United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon for Sunday, January 31st, 2021, is entitled, Whose? It's a reflection on a reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministry at the Congregational Church of Needham, simply head over to our website, www.needhamucc.org. Thank you. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught there. Those gathered were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and power, and not as the scribes and the other other religious leaders did. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked them, saying, Be silent and come out of them. And the unclean spirit, convulsing them and crying with a loud voice, came out of them. All who witnessed this were amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with power and authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Beloved, God is still speaking to the world. May our hearts be open to listen and to respond. Amen. Good morning again, my friends. Today, I wanna talk to you about that annual meeting that we mentioned earlier. The annual meeting is something in the life of our church that's really important because it helps us to make decisions and to show what's important to us as a church. So how do you make decisions at home as an individual, as just you? How do you show the world who you wanna be? Maybe you wanna show people that you love Batman. So when you wake up in the morning, before you get ready for your Zoom classroom or your in-person school, you put on a Batman shirt so that everyone knows how much you love Batman. Maybe when your family wants to make an important decision about where they're gonna go on vacation, you sit around your kitchen table and you talk about the things that you love and that are important to you. Maybe your mom loves the mountains or your grandpa loves the beach or you love driving in the car for hours on end and you don't care where you end up. Well, the annual meeting is how we as a church make decisions together about who we are and who we believe God is asking us to be. We, be, we start by reading this thing called the annual report and this is all of the stuff that we've done in the last year that's important to us. So we learn about what our children and our youth are doing because you are important to us. We learn about what our music ministries have been doing because music fills our heart and helps us to worship God. We learn about the environmental ministry team and outreach and Guatemala and all these other ministries and groups that help us to be God's presence and love in the world. And we vote on brand new members to serve on those committees. We say, we believe that you can help us be our very best selves as a church. And so we vote new folks in to help guide us. And we vote on our budget. And that might sound like just plain old business, but how we spend our money shows what's important to us. So if we want to be, um, if we want to support 
our community will put some of our money into outreach. If we want to make sure that our building is a warm and inviting place where uh, groups, when it's safe, where groups can, can rent from us, groups like uh, we've had Girl Scout groups, we've had quilters come and, and build community that way. If we want to do that, we make sure that there's room in the budget in our line items for that. Um, <laughs> for that. So we make lots of big, important decisions today. So I would like you, kids and youth, to help me pray for our members who are going to vote on this. Let's pray together. Dear God, we know that these decisions are important. Please be with our church as they work together to show our community who, how you love, who we are, and who we want to be. Amen. Now, at this point in the service, a preacher with any good sense at all would sit down knowing that Maddie had just preached the exact right sermon for this moment. Fortunately, no one has ever accused me of being that preacher. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead. Mercifully, my message this morning is brief. Uh, but then in over 21 years in ministry, I've never heard of a preacher being chastised for too short a sermon, at least not in our church tradition and especially not on an annual meeting Sunday when we have miles to go before we sleep and miles to go before we sleep. Still, as brief as it may be, I hope I will be able to give us all something to chew on through this annual meeting and in the days ahead, much as our brief reading from the gospel according to Mark does. This passage from Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, is the very first account in that gospel of Jesus' public ministry. Up to this point, he's been introduced being baptized by John in the River Jordan. He's fasted and prayed in the wilderness for 40 days. He's called his very first disciples. He's called Peter and Andrew, James and John. And he has begun to share the word of God that is in him, saying to any who would listen, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Immediately then, these next verses mark Jesus' first preaching engagement at a Sabbath service in the synagogue at Capernaum where we're told the congregation was intrigued by him, for he taught them as one having authority, one having power. That's the very same word in the original Greek text. And not, they said, as the scribes and the other religious leaders did. Which makes you wonder just how it was that those scribes usually preached and what it was about Jesus that struck them so differently. But we don't have much time in the course of the story to wonder because at that moment, everything is interrupted, including the worship in that synagogue on the Sabbath day by the unruly cries of a person described as being possessed by an unclean spirit who shouts aloud, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? For I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. I don't want to get tangled up in an argument over the reality or unreality of demon possession. And given the brevity of this encounter in the text, neither does the gospel writer. Rather, I do want to focus on this person's social location and their location in the narrative. In the entire Gospel of Mark, this disturbed person held captive in their heart and mind and body and bound also to the raggedy edges of their community. 
This person, nonetheless, is the very first person to recognize Jesus, or rather, to recognize what's happening in Jesus, who he is, and what he's about. You are the Holy One of God. Come to break the foothold of evil in this world and destroy the power of sin and death forever which Jesus then does with a word. Be silent and come out of him. And they did. Which makes you wonder just what they saw in Jesus that led them to be not just astonished or astounded or amazed or even just merely amused like the crowd, but actually moved moved enough to move on and move out. What is it about Jesus, about his words? What is it about his presence, his power and evident purpose that causes them to recognize the hand of God at work and so be changed for good? And we, the church, gathered in Jesus' name some 2,000 years later. What about us? Would people recognize Jesus in us? Do we in our daily lives as individuals and as a community of faith, do we bear any family resemblance to our founder? What do our neighbors think? What do strangers passing by on the street or reading an article in the newspaper or a a post on Facebook, what do they think when they see us, if they see us? After all, our building here on the corner of Great Plain and Linden bears a striking and unfortunate resemblance to the post office across the street, same bricks, same architecture. You got to wonder what people see if they see us. And the powers and principalities of this world, all the unclean spirits and systems of sin in which we are swimming, who do they believe we are? And whose do they believe we are? I don't have any answers for us today. That's one reason it's a particularly short sermon. But I do have a lot of questions. Not just questions for today, but questions that occur to me over and over, and I hope occur to you as well. And please hear me when I say these are meant as real, live, genuine inquiries, and in no way indictments of our life together. Because on this Sunday, when we gather for our annual congregational meeting and reflect on the year past and set our directions for the year ahead, questions are good. Questions are what we need, and not just any questions, but the right questions, without which even the best of answers, let's just say, are less than helpful. And for us, As a church, few questions could be more important than the question that hangs over the entire Gospel of Mark from this point forward. The question Jesus will eventually put directly to his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And what do you believe I'm about. I wonder if we were to poll our neighbors in Needham and the surrounding communities and even online, who would they say we are? Who do they say we are? How do we show them who we are and what we believe? Now, I know all of us are good, 
mainline Protestant believers who have internalized Matthew's injunction against praying aloud like the Pharisees do, and all of us instead simply go into our closets and close the door and pray in secret to our Father who sees in secret. But looking at the example of Jesus, part of this has got to be public. If a tree falls in the forest and there is no one there to, to see it and to hear it, does it actually fall? If a church stands on the corner of Great Plain and Linden and no one sees the work of God, the hand of God, and the call to justice, peace, and compassion of the Holy Spirit pouring forth from us, are we really a church? Who would our neighbors say that we are? Who would our neighbors say that we are? And more importantly, given the context of this particular story, do the unclean spirits abroad in our world today, the spirit of the possessions that possess us, the spirits of unclean power, not holy power as of God, but power that seeks to dominate and diminish and drive down, power that seems only to pile up and cast others off. Would people see the power of God for liberation, for justice, for peace? Would they see that alive and active in us today? Do we bear the face of Jesus to our neighbors, to strangers, to those in need? Do the powers and principalities of this world, like this unclean spirit in the story in Mark today, do they see the God in us and tremble, not because of who we are, but because of how we are willing to let God work in us and through us, not simply to make things nice and easy and gentle, but to rock the boat, to right the boat, to turn the world that is already inside out, right side up again, to make sure that those who are deemed lowest and least are first in line for the good things that they have been denied, while those who have been over-satisfied learn to live with less. Again, no answers here today, but so many questions. And I hope they are the questions, not the questions that keep you up at night, but the questions that allow you to sleep at night to know that you are engaged with this one who comes among us and speaks and lives, whose own life, not just his words, are the lesson for us, the model for us. To know that we are in conversation, question and answer with this one who is the Holy One of God, calling us to be Holy Ones of God as well. This is our calling as the church today. These are the questions that I hope guide us in our discussions in the annual meeting that will follow worship and the next day and the day after that and the day after that. Who do we say that Jesus is when the world looks at us? Who do they say we are and whose? And so, friends, if you've heard the word of God in these questions today, remember to give all honor and glory to our one God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen.